This is enzyme coupled receptors uh, introduction. So I wanted to give you guys a little sneak peek or spoiler alert for this topic, how it relates to the G protein coupled receptors and where we're going with this um, receptor signaling section of the course. So the, there's two uh, big things I want to point out. First off is that you're going to see some compare and contrast between these different sorts of receptor proteins, um, one of which is that they both activate GTP binding proteins. I would highly encourage you to go check out these pages of your text, uh, 535 to 537, since they'll uh, put a little broader context about receptor signaling, and go back to kind of the beginning part about the three different types of cell surface receptors, two of which are these. Um, and here's kind of just cut to the chase. So for GPCRs, we've already talked about how their G protein is a heterotrimer, with alpha, beta, and gamma. And in particular, uh, the part of it, of this heterotrimer that binds to GTP is G alpha. For the enzyme coupled receptors, these are also GTP binding proteins. Um, and instead, there's gonna be a monomer, and it's just called RAS. And since there's only one part, that's the part that binds GTP. Uh, secondly, I wanted to remind you that from the mutant analysis lecture, we talked a bit about enzyme-coupled receptors. Um, in particular, we talked about a dominant negative receptor mutation. And the example I gave you was the FGF receptor. Um, and that's one example of an enzyme-coupled receptor. So uh, this may look familiar to you, uh, this particular slide, because it's slide four from that lecture. And so um, we're going to go into some more detail about the domains here. You may recall from your notes that we had three different domains that we picked out uh, for the FGF receptor. So our token enzyme-coupled receptor is the receptor tyrosine kinase receptor, or RTK. And so here's some shared features about enzyme-coupled receptors. They are single-pass transmembrane proteins. And they have three domains. So the first domain is this ligand binding domain. And so that's this part here. And um, Basically, that face is outside the cell. It's extracellular. Secondly, they have a transmembrane domain. And third, they have a cytoplasmic region, uh, cytoplasmic domain, uh, of which this is broken down into two parts here. We see the kinase domain, which has the enzymatic capability. And then we see the cytosolic tail, and this is the region that is phosphorylated. And so technically, you might uh, consider breaking these down into two different domains. Um, for our purposes, we'll just call it the cytoplasmic region. And there's certainly a kinase domain here. And then this is a portion of the protein uh, which is acted upon by other, um, another protein. Let's talk a little bit about the type of ligands that bind to enzyme-coupled receptors. In this case, we're talking about receptor tyrosine kinases. So most of the ligands... Um, are growth factors, which we abbreviate GF. And as you can see in this very specific example, we see this EGF name. The EGF is for epidermal growth factor, and this one of the classic examples, um, again, of a receptor tyrosine kinase, which falls into this larger group of enzyme-coupled receptors. And then typically their accompanying receptor is EGFR, 
Um, and so any sort of time we talk about these growth factors, then we uh, usually just add an R to indicate the receptor. But be careful about that because you want to know exactly which part of the signaling pathway you're talking about. The ligand does not have the R, uh, but the receptor does. All right, and as their name implies, they are growth factors, um, which sounds like a pretty generic and kind of boring process, but this is a really key and core process for cellular um, lifespan. So as a growth factor, growth factors are typically going to queue up cell division. So their role is um, one, of, one or more of the following to stimulate growth. Or cell proliferation, which is another way to say cell division, and they can also uh, stimulate uh, cell survival. We're going to see some of their downstream effects, but just kind of in general, these can have slow or fast responses, um, so most of them will stimulate gene transcription. of course, would be a slow response, and some will have other effects, such as remodeling the cytoskeleton, or activate cytoplasmic signaling. Both of which are fast responses. A couple other things about this receptor um, structure. So basically, we can have some variations here, um, especially in the cytosolic region. Typically, they will be single-pass transmembrane uh, proteins, uh, but they may have multiple uh, tyrosine kinase or other kinase domains. They may have uh, more or less of the amino acid residues, which can be phosphorylated. In this case, we're seeing that there are one, two, three, four, five, I think one, two, three, four, five, yep, um, tyrosine residues or tyrosine amino acids within this region um, of the protein. And these can each be phosphorylated um, by a kinase enzyme. When we say that this uh, particular region is a tyrosine kinase, that means that it has the ability to add phosphate groups to tyrosine residues. There are three amino acid residues that are um, possible to be phosphorylated, and you will see these. Uh, so basically, uh, note here, tyrosine, serine, and threonine are the likely amino acids that, to be phosphorylated. And as the name of this entire group uh, has kinase in the name, receptor tyrosine kinase, you can imagine you're going to see quite a lot of this sort of activity. Okay, now let's talk about um, how the receptors are activated. So on the left, we have the inactive form, and then on the right, we have the active form. This figure, by the way, is not from your textbook. Um, I just like this one a little bit better. There are some uh, portions of figure 16-32 that look a lot like this, however. So basically for activation, we need two subunits of the protein. And so basically we see one receptor protein here and then we see another receptor protein here. When they are um, both bound by the ligand, in this case epidermal growth factor, and when each of the receptor proteins is bound by the ligand, then they can form a dimer, a receptor dimer. So here's our steps. Um, First off, note that the unbound receptor is a monomer. And then as we go through the steps of activation, the first step is that the bound receptor dimerizes. And this dimerization leads to a conformational change. Um, and part of that is indicated by these little um, shape changes here. You can also see that they are uh, tightly associated with one another. And that conformational change activates the kinase domain.
at this point, then one of the receptor proteins can phosphorylate the other one, and we call this cross-phosphorylation. And sometimes you'll hear it referred to as autophosphorylation, though technically it's one of the receptor um, monomers phosphorylating the other one. And as we can see on this diagram, there are tyrosine residues that have phosphate groups added to them, uh, and so basically that's where the phosphorylation events take place. And after that, um, downstream signaling is activated. And so that would be another uh, series of events um, which would be happening in the cytoplasmic region. Here's the figure from your textbook. It is 16-32. I just cut off uh, the very right-hand part of it, and again, you can see um, this activity in a format which we're going to build upon as we look at other uh, related figures.